This is a Fox News alert. I'm Brett Baer in Washington. The testimony before the testimony. Former FBI Director James Comey says in prepared opening remarks released today that President Trump asked him for loyalty and that he hoped Comey could find his way to let go of the investigation into former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Comey says he did not take that to mean the president wanted him to abandon the broader investigation into possible Russian interference in the election or links to the Trump campaign. And he did not pass it on to FBI investigators at that time. Comey also did tell President Trump, according to the detailed notes Comey took at the time of those one-on-one -on -one meetings, that the president was not personally the target or focus of an investigation, an assurance Comey offered three separate times, as President Trump told NBC last month. Those are some of the headlines from the prepared testimony that hit Washington today like an earthquake when it was released a few hours ago. Tomorrow, Comey will deliver those remarks and take questions from the Senate Intelligence Committee. That will be the main event in a dynamic doubleheader of Senate hearings concerning those investigations and what the president did or did not request or order. Today, the men who guard America's secrets said they did not feel any pressure to squelch or silence any investigations, but they would not directly discuss specific discussions they had with President Trump, reported from anonymous sources in the media. We have Fox team coverage tonight. John Roberts at the White House with reaction, plus a surprise personnel move a day ahead of the Comey hearing. Howie Kurtz in the White House briefing room fact-checking the media against the Comey remarks. But well, we start off tonight on Capitol Hill and Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge on what the former FBI chief will say tomorrow. Good evening, Catherine. Brett, the seven pages of prepared testimony for the record contain one revelation after another. After a January 6th briefing at Trump Tower to discuss unverified intelligence targeting the incoming president, James Comey had already discussed with senior FBI leadership whether he should be prepared to tell Mr. Trump he was not under federal investigation. We agreed I should do so if circumstances warranted, based on President-elect Trump's reaction to the briefing, and without him directly asking the question, I offered that assurance. At a dinner later that month, now President Trump asked Comey if he wanted to stay on as FBI director. The president said, I need loyalty. I expect loyalty. I didn't move, speak, or change my facial expression in any way during the awkward silence that followed, Comey writes. We simply looked at each other in silence. Later in the conversation, the president returned to the subject. I need loyalty. I replied, you will always get honesty from me. He paused and then said, that's what I want, honest loyalty. I paused and then said, you will get that from me. After a February 14th meeting, the president raised the issue of National Security Advisor Mike Flynn, who resigned a day earlier. I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go. He is a good guy. I hope you can let this go. Comey stated, I had understood the president to be requesting that we drop any investigation of Flynn in connection with false statements about his conversations with the Russian ambassador in December. I did not understand the president to be talking about the broader investigation into Russia or possible links to his campaign. Comey continued, it was very concerning, given the FBI's role as an independent investigative agency. The FBI leadership team agreed with me that it was important not to infect the investigative team with the president's request, which we did not intend to abide. We also concluded that, given that it was a one-on-one -on -one conversation, there was nothing available to corroborate my account. In March, Comey made a rare public statement. I have been authorized by the Department of Justice to confirm that the FBI, as part of our counterintelligence mission, is investigating the Russian government's efforts to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. About 10 days later, Comey got a call from the president where he described the investigation as a cloud impairing his ability to act on behalf of the country. He asked what we could do to lift the cloud. I responded that we were investigating the matter as quickly as we could and that there would be great benefit if we didn't find anything to our having done the work well. He agreed, but then re-emphasized the problems this was causing him. Comey's prepared testimony quickly overshadowed today's hearing with top intelligence leaders. This pattern where the president seems to want to interfere or downplay or halt 
the ongoing investigation, not only the Justice Department's taking on, but this committee's taking on. In the three plus years that I have been the director of the National Security Agency, to the best of my recollection, I have never been directed to do anything I believe to be illegal, immoral, unethical, or inappropriate. For intelligence-related matters or any other matters that have been discussed, um, uh, it is my uh, belief uh, that it's inappropriate for me to uh, share that with the public. Traveling overseas, Coates' predecessor said the issues threatened to unravel. I live through uh, Watergate. I have to say, though, that I think, uh, you know, compare the two, that Watergate pales uh, really, uh, in my view, uh, as, as compared to what we're, uh, we're confronting now. The committee's ranking Democrat said he will bring forward a witness, a former administration official, who saw political interference. But Senator Mark Warner did not identify that witness by name today, Brett. Catherine, thank you. Just hours ahead of live testimony from the former FBI chief, President Trump has announced his pick for a replacement at the FBI. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts says that and reaction from the Republican Party and reaction from the president to Comey's prepared comments. Good evening, John. Brett, good evening to you. No official reaction from the White House to Comey's prepared testimony, but the outside counsel acting on behalf of the president, Mark Kasowitz, did weigh in late this afternoon in a statement to Fox News saying that the president is pleased that Mr. Comey has finally publicly confirmed his private reports that the president was not under investigation in any Russia probe. The president feels completely and totally vindicated. He is eager to continue to move forward with his agenda. The president did take some action on this front today, moving to get ahead of Comey's testimony tomorrow by announcing his pick to replace him at the FBI. President Trump in Cincinnati today to talk about rebuilding the infrastructure of our inland waterways. But before he left the White House, a preemptive strike against testimony tomorrow from James Comey, announcing a new nominee for FBI director. The president's choice is Christopher Wray, a high-powered criminal attorney who represented New Jersey Governor Chris Christie in the Bridgegate scandal. After four years as an assistant U.S. attorney in Georgia, Ray was appointed to the Department of Justice by President Bush in 2001. In 2003, he was unanimously confirmed to head up the DOJ's criminal division. President Trump was down to two finalists, Ray and former TSA Administrator John Pistol. In a statement, the president said of Ray, quote, he is an impeccably qualified individual, and I know that he will again serve his country as a fierce guardian of the law and model of integrity. Ray's announcement came in a single early morning tweet from the president. Much of his staff, including his communications team, weren't aware of the pick. The president also didn't inform the chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, who will lead Ray's confirmation hearings. Uh, I believe that he probably tried to get a hold of me, but I wasn't available because I was over in the House uh, testifying this morning. And he didn't tell the Speaker of the House either. I don't know the guy, but he, I've looked at his resume. He seems like the, the right perfect. He, looked, he seems like to me he's the perfect kind of person. The reaction from Democrats to Ray has been muted. The ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, Senator Dianne Feinstein, saying, quote, he may be fine. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi said only that in the current environment, Ray, quote, should be subject to the utmost scrutiny. The White House was on full mute over reports Attorney General Jeff Sessions offered to resign because of rising tensions with the president. President Trump is said to be still fuming that Sessions recused himself from the Russia investigation, eventually giving way to the appointment of special counsel Robert Mueller. The president made clear his thoughts just hours before Sessions took himself out. Mr. President, should Sessions uh, recuse himself from investigations of the air campaign in Russia? I don't think so at all. In preparation for tomorrow's testimony by James Comey, the Republican National Committee has launched a major rapid response organization. They will flood the zone with surrogates on television and radio and will also have a major fact-checking operation going on social media. And in response to Comey's testimony this afternoon, a source very close to the president told me that he was interested to note that there was not a single act of either collusion or obstruction that was noted by James Comey. The reason this person said because he can't identify one. Brett? This afternoon, a source very close to the president told me that he was interested to note that there was not a single act of either collusion or obstruction that was noted by James Comey. The reason this person said, because he can't identify one. Brett? 
Fox News media analyst and host of Fox's Media Buzz, Howard Kurtz, looks at what the media may have gotten right and gotten wrong about the Comey testimony so far. He's in the White House briefing room tonight. Good evening, Howie. Good evening, Brett. Now that we have James Comey's testimony, how does it stack up against all the leaks? ABC News reported yesterday that the fired FBI director, quote, will dispute the president's contention that Comey told him three times he is not under investigation. Tonight, a source familiar with Comey's thinking tells ABC News that the former FBI director will directly contradict what the president wrote in the letter notifying him he was fired. That was wrong. Comey says in his statement that in a dinner and two phone calls, he did discuss that President Trump was not personally under FBI investigation, just as Mr. Trump had said. ABC also reported that Comey will testify that he does not believe the president was obstructing justice and asking him to consider dropping his probe of former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. But Comey's testimony offers no opinion on whether it was obstruction or not. The testimony does confirm last month's New York Times story, saying the president told him of the Flynn investigation, quote, I hope you can let this go. Comey also backs up the president's insistence to NBC's Lester Holt, as you noted, Brett, that he did not try to derail the Russia probe. I want to find out if there was a problem with an election having to do with Russia. The former director says he understood the president to be talking about dropping the Flynn inquiry, not the broader Russia investigation. Comey confirms last month's Washington Post story that the president had asked for his loyalty and that he replied he could offer only honesty. The president denied asking the loyalty question in an interview with Fox's Jeanine Pirro. Comey's language almost perfectly matches some of the leaked stories because those reports were based partially on his own private memos. Brett? Howie, thank you. Let's get reaction to Comey's prepared testimony, a preview of tomorrow's hearing, and a look ahead, uh, look back rather at today's hearing. Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma is a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee. He was there today. He joins us tonight. Senator, thanks for being here. Glad to be with you. You've read the testimony, I'm sure. Uh, your take initially of this? Yeah, I was uh, actually very pleased to have Frank uh, Jim Comey is uh, in a day and age where you often get, uh, we'll think about this, I'll give you another moment, another time. Uh, he was very clear, articulated out multiple different conversations, gave the details of it, and uh, was very open. So we look forward to that kind of open conversation, get the rest of the information tomorrow. You've heard some people talk about this specific uh effort in February 14th Oval Office meeting uh, talking about Michael Flynn. President Trump, quote, repeated that Flynn hadn't done anything wrong in his calls with the Russians, but had misled the vice president. He said then, I hope you can see your way clear to letting this go, to letting Flynn go. He's a good guy. I hope you can let this go. I replied only he's a good guy. I did not say I would let this go. I had understood the president to be requesting that we drop in any, any investigation of Flynn in connection with false statements about his conversations with the Russian ambassador in December. I did not understand the president be talking about the broader investigation into Russia or possible links to his campaign. I could be wrong, but I took him to be focusing on what had just happened with Flynn's departure and the controversy around his account of his phone calls. Regardless, it was very concerning, given the FBI's role as an independent investigative agency. Now, there are some tonight who are saying that this is obstruction of justice. No, I, I would disagree that it rises to that level. We'll actually walk through and get greater details on that tomorrow when we visit with Jim Comey. Jim Comey was concerned about it, didn't like it, didn't want to be alone with the president at other times, thought that put him in an awkward situation. Uh, he had mentioned that later on in his written prepared statement there. But what he's very clear on is that the president wasn't saying to him, you've got to do this or else, or this is the shift, or get into the Russia probe or anything else. I, what I hear from it is the president had just fired Flynn, who he liked and who he respected, but understood he lied to the vice president. He's not going to do that and be his administration. And was trying to say, we fired him. That's enough is what it sounds like. Is this also going to go into a probe as well? I've also heard supporters of the president today saying this is how he talks. He's a real estate developer from New York. He's not used to the Washington ways of dealing with this. Is that how you see it? Yeah, that's exactly how I saw it. The first time that I read through this earlier today when it came out was this reads like the president talks. It sounds like a guy who is not a Washington guy. Uh, America did not select a Washington guy or a politician. They hired a uh, New York business guy. Uh, and he came in. He's in the process of hiring people. It doesn't surprise me. He's sitting down with all the people that he's hiring and putting on board face to face and saying, I need you to be loyal. Uh, that's a part of being a part of this. We've heard that term over and over again. 
again uh, for the other cabinet officials and folks that when the president meets with him on that, he sits down with Comey a week into his presidency and says, basically, you're the same as everyone else. Comey is sitting there apparently thinking, I'm not like everyone else. I'm an independent investigator. I'm leading the FBI. And I think Comey sees this different than the president did. The president sees him as another part of the team. Uh, Comey seems to see it as, hey, we're very independent, which the FBI has historically been very independent. I know you're going to press um, the former FBI director tomorrow, and he'll be pressed on a number of fronts. But his explanation in this prepared testimony about why he doesn't tell the FBI investigators about this concern and others up the chain of command. Do you buy that? I do. It, it seems that Comey's explanation was I wasn't taking this up to the chain of command initially because he didn't see this as anything uh, off. Uh, he was writing notes just to be able to keep track of but it. But he does say he's very meetings. concerned. He was concerned later. Uh, you get several months down the road, you get down to the Michael Flynn conversation uh, and that raised a concern for him to say, hey, I don't need to be alone with the president. I don't want to be there. I need to find someone to report that to. But at the time, obviously, there's no one to report it to. Is it right for a president to ask an FBI director, I need loyalty, I expect loyalty? Uh, I think it's right for a president to expect him to be honest. And I would say that's the best way to handle it. Uh, with this president and his background and his business dealings and the way that he normally handles everyone else, I'd give him the benefit of the doubt in the first month. And th in that case, in the first week, uh, he's in the office to be able to learn his way through the process. I but what, I did, what I didn't see is him being pressured by anyone else. And didn't, Jim Comey doesn't articulate anyone else pressuring him. I want to talk about today's hearing and play just some of the exchanges there on that hearing today. I have never been directed to do anything I believe to be illegal, immoral, unethical, or inappropriate. I do not recall ever feeling pressured to do so. I have never felt pressure uh, to uh, intervene or interfere in any way and shape with shaping intelligence in a political way uh, or um, in, in relationship all to I, an all ongoing I, investigation. All I, there was a chance here to lay to rest some of these press reports. But at some point, these facts have to come out. Uh, with all due respect to my colleague from Virginia, I think you have cleared up uh, substantially uh, your direct testimony that you have never been pressured by anyone, including the President of the United States, to do something illegal, immoral, or anything else. Thank you for that. Not surprisingly, how you looked at that depended on which side of the aisle you sat on. You heard Senator Risch there saying they did answer your question. Right. But the Democrats and others commentating on this say, why couldn't they answer the direct question? Yes or no, it did or didn't happen. So the Democrats on the panel want to get into specific conversations and say, what did the president say? What did you say? And get into that specifics. They didn't want to get into the specifics at all, saying we're not going to talk about specific conversations we've had with the president. Uh, we will only tell you that in, the, in a general sense and a flat out statement, we've never been pressured, never felt pressured, never been asked to do anything that was inconsistent, morally, legally, whatever it may be. They were very clear on a very broad spectrum saying that's never happened. But I will not talk about individual conversations. Conversations I've had with the president. Democrats hated that. Republicans looked at that and said, okay, that's good to know. Or at least an open testimony. Right. We don't know if they wouldn't close. Finally, and before I let you go, um, you just got back from Syria and Iraq. Right. Uh, we have a couple pictures of you uh, touring uh, briefly your assessment of, of how the fight against ISIS what's, is going. What's pretty there. remarkable about in Iraq and in Syria is the Iraqis are fighting in Mosul. Uh, we're advising and in the back lines, uh, but the Iraqis are fighting in Iraq. The Syrians are fighting in Syria. Uh, that's the clearest message that you can see what's actually happening on the ground there and real progress has been made. ISIS only has control of really three areas, smaller regions in the far western side of Iraq, including the very center of Mosul, Sinjar Valley in the, in the southwest. And in Syria, it's really only the Euphrates Valley is all they've got left. So the noose really is being circled around them and the, and the Iraqis and the Syrians are taking the fight directly to the ISIS. Senator, we appreciate your time. We look forward, obviously, to covering the hearing tomorrow. Yeah, look forward to it as well. Thanks. An absolutely blistering blistering report tonight out saying the Obama administration in general and former Attorney General Eric Holder in particular repeatedly lied to the family of a slain Border Patrol officer about the weapons used in his death and stonewalled efforts to get at the truth. Correspondent William Lajeunesse tonight on Operation Fast and Furious. My only goal was to make sure he was laid to rest with honors. That honor has been insulted by cover-ups and deception by the very people he served. Border Patrol agent Brian Terry died in December 2010, killed by guns tied to an Obama administration plan that armed Mexicans, a scandal officials tried to hide by wrongly claiming executive privilege. The department's belated admission 
that those 64,000 pages were not privileged puts the gold seal of authenticity on the House's bipartisan vote to hold the Attorney General in contempt. Emails contained in the House Oversight Committee's report show top officials knew the ATF sent guns to Mexico even before Terry's death. It's a tricky case given the number of guns that have walked, said a Deputy Attorney General. A colleague replied, it is not going to be any big surprise a bunch of U.S. guns are being used in Mexico, so I'm not sure how much grief we get for guns walking. Months later, two of those guns were used against Agent Terry, a fact denied to Congress and Terry's family. Only one possible motivation remains for all of those involved who have covered up Fast and Furious. That is to conceal their own shame and disgrace. Even the Border Patrol, which sent Terry's team into the desert, didn't know about the operation. I believe that if Brian Terry and his team had known this information, chances are Brian would be alive today. The report claims the administration tried to stop the investigation by discrediting whistleblower John Dodson. I was lied about, disparaged, publicly attacked, ridiculed, libeled. I've been transferred 11 times, denied promotion, ostracized, barred from government workplaces, and banned from public buildings. Lawmakers noted no one from the ATF or Justice Department was fired or seriously disciplined for the cover-up. Brett? William, thank you. The Justice Department is ending the practice of allowing big companies and banks to settle cases by donating money to outside organizations. A memo, for, a memo from Attorney General Jeff Sessions says money should go to victims or the Treasury, not third parties that are often special interest groups or political friends of those in power. Terrorism comes to a home of a state-sponsored terrorism. That's next. Another Fox News alert tonight, major breaking news out of South Korea. The new administration in Seoul is pulling the plug on the latest high-tech American missile defense system. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin is at the Pentagon to tell us why. Hi, Jen. Brett, in an apparent concession to China, an official for the South Korean government announced today that it would suspend the deployment of a crucial U.S. missile defense system designed to intercept long-range North Korean missiles. The official said the two launchers of the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, or THAAD, that have already been installed can remain, but the four other launchers the Pentagon needs for the system to be more effective would be put on hold. The Pentagon has not been officially informed of the decision, but issued the following terse response. Quote, the U.S. trusts the ROK official stance that the THAAD deployment was an alliance decision and it will not be reversed. The top Democrat on the House Armed Services Committee said the decision shows a potential rift with Seoul. Certainly it has tactical implications for deterring North Korea that are deeply concerning. China and its proxy North Korea view the THAAD radar as a threat. The Pentagon deployed two of the launchers to an abandoned golf course 135 miles southeast of Seoul in April. On a trip to Asia last week, officials traveling with Defense Secretary Jim Mattis seemed to indicate the deal was complete. We have been consulting with the Iraq government throughout this entire process uh, to get the entire battery, uh, THAAD battery, to the Korean Peninsula, which includes six launches. The Pentagon is taking a wait-and-see attitude, but some see it as a challenge for President Trump's North Korea policy at a time of uncertainty on the Korean Peninsula when they would prefer to present a united front against North Korea and China. Brett. And Jen, some news tonight about the Pentagon's ability to defend the homeland against an incoming missile. That's right, Brett. Pentagon officials say this is the equivalent of getting upgraded to a triple A-plus rating from Moody's and comes in the wake of that successful missile defense test at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California recently. Fox News has obtained a memo sent on June 6 to the defense secretary, which says that the U.S. Missile Defense Agency is now, for the first time, capable of defending the U.S. homeland. The memo was written by the Independent Operational Test and Evaluation Director. Brett. Jennifer Griffin, live at the Pentagon. Jennifer, thank you. Terrorism has come to Iran's capital tonight. ISIS terrorists are claiming responsibility for attacks on the country's parliament and a major shrine that left at least 12 people dead. Correspondent John Huddy tells us what happened from our Middle East newsroom. A country accused of state-sponsored terrorism, now the target of terrorism. 
Gunmen and suicide bombers attacked Iran's parliament building and the Ayatollah Khomeini mausoleum today in Tehran. The bloodbath lasted for hours, leaving 12 dead and 42 others wounded. In one picture, a little boy is lowered from a window at the parliament. Police eventually shot and killed the gunman. But today's violence was a blow to Iran's elite security forces and perhaps a sign of more to come. People were panicked and started running away and seeking shelter. Then ambulances arrived and gunfire sound increased. ISIS claimed responsibility for the attacks. If true, it would be the first time the terror group has launched an attack inside Iran. Iranian-backed forces have been fighting ISIS in Iraq and Syria, and ISIS has threatened reprisal. ISIS purportedly released this video showing the attackers on their bloody rampage praising God while opening fire. A man covered in blood is curled up motionless on the floor. While Iranian officials call the attackers terrorists, they stop short of blaming ISIS. This attack will definitely fortify the resolve for our people in the fight against terrorism. All Iranian people and our military will resist against this universal threat. Iran's foreign minister also said that multilateral cooperation is needed in fighting terrorism. Other Iranian officials, meanwhile, blamed Saudi Arabia and even the United States for today's violence, violence the U.S. State Department condemned as depraved with no place in a peaceful world. Brett. John Huddy in our Middle East newsroom. John, thank you. The former wife of one of the London Bridge attackers says she's deeply shocked, saddened, and numbed by her former partner's action. The Italian mother of another attacker says his son, her son rather, was always very hard on himself and became radicalized in the last year while living in London. Eight people were killed and nearly 50 injured. The three attackers were killed by police. Tomorrow, voters participate in early parliamentary elections called by Prime Minister Theresa May. And terrorism is, of course, expected to be a major issue there. Back here in the U.S., stocks rebounded today. The Dow gained 37. The S&P 500 finished ahead four. The Nasdaq jumped 22. Up next, the panel on the James Coney, Comey testimony, what's out, and the analysis. Did you at any time urge former FBI Director James Comey in any way, shape, or form to close or to back down the investigation into Michael Flynn? And also, as you look no. back... No. No. Next question. Can they halt that FBI investigation? In theory, yes. Has it happened? Not in my experience, because it would be a big deal to tell the FBI to stop doing something that, without an appropriate purpose. I'm talking about a situation where we were told to stop something for a political reason. That would be a very big deal. It's not happened in my experience. Well, that was testimony May 3rd. We have prepared testimony for Jim Comey tomorrow, uh, in which a meeting on February 14th, he says, I hope you can let this go about the Michael Flynn investigation, his former NSA uh, uh, director. But he calls that, Comey does, it was very concerning when the president told me that. But January 27th, it's dinner. He, the president began by asking me whether I wanted to stay on as FBI director. My instincts told me that the one-on-one -on -one setting, the, the pretense that this was our first discussion about my position, meant the dinner was, at least in part, an effort to have me ask for my job and create some sort of patronage relationship. That concerned me greatly, given the FBI's traditionally independent status in the executive branch. A few moments later, the president said, I need loyalty. I expect loyalty. Near the end of our dinner, the president returned to the subject of my job. He then said, I need loyalty. I replied, you will always get honesty from me. He paused and then said, that's what I want, honest loyalty. I paused and then said, you will get that from me. Some of the prepared testimony from Jim Comey in tomorrow's Senate hearing. Let's bring in our panel. Byron York, chief political correspondent of the Washington Examiner. Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist. Charles Lane, opinion writer for The Washington Post. And syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. Byron, your thoughts. Well, uh, the first thing he did was he confirmed some of the reports that we've seen that, that uh, the, the president asked him if he could consider letting go the uh, Michael Flynn investigation. This was after Flynn was fired. Uh, he confirmed what you were just reading, the, the, the loyalty uh, request, although that's something we hear the president has asked almost everybody he's hired. Uh, on the other hand, uh, he did confirm what the president said, which was that uh, Comey told the president on not one, not two, but three occasions 
that he, Donald Trump, was not under investigation in that. And, and we've seen a, a, a very brief statement from the president's lawyer saying that he now feels completely and totally vindicated by this. I, my guess is tomorrow what you're going to see is Democrats saying that Comey has just given them dead solid evidence of obstruction and Republicans saying this makes us feel a lot better. We think it can all be explained innocently. Molly, on that point, you know, the president obviously talked to Lester Holt with NBC, said, laid out the different meetings, said that he had been told that he wasn't under investigation. And then we had a series of stories from anonymous sources saying that Comey was not going to say that and it was not true. But Comey does say that in this prepared testimony. Right. In a sense, Comey is the most helpful to Trump's case of anyone in the entire scenario. We've had so many anonymously sourced stories claiming that Trump would undermine or that Comey would undermine what Trump has said about being told that he wasn't under investigation. Uh, and, and just even the detailing of these meetings paints a picture of Trump going out of his way to uh, to talk to Comey, try and work with him. He is told repeatedly that he's not under investigation. He's dealing with an FBI director who, for some reason, is going on the Hill and making it seem like he is under investigation. And these these stories are actually, I think, pretty favorable to Donald Trump, even if he is very different from a typical uh, politician in this scenario. Comey says the reason that he didn't express concern, that he was very concerned about the Michael Flynn comment, was because of the investigation that was ongoing. If we could look at testimony testimony one, uh, the FBI leadership team agreed with me that it was important not to infect the investigative team with the president's request, which we did not intend to abide. We also concluded that given that it was a one-on-one -on -one conversation, there was nothing available to corroborate uh, my account. We concluded it made little sense to report it to Attorney General Session, Sessions, who we expected would likely recuse himself from involvement in Russia-related investigations. He did so two weeks later. This is what he writes at the time, the reason he didn't put it up to chain, Chuck. But I just played that May 3rd soundbite where he suggests, at least, that he hasn't seen any pressure. And it would be wrong if there was pressure to drop an investigation. That is uh, probably the hardest question for Comey in this whole business is, well, wait a minute, if it was so terrible, why didn't you take it up the chain? And what I interpret that statement that you just read to mean is sort of an extremely complicated explanation as to why it would have been more trouble than it was worth to take this up the chain, given that it would have been a he said, he said situation. Look, the, the Comey statement that came out today um, does not resolve this matter, as Byron said. It's going to be viewed through a partisan lens up on the Hill. I think it's marginally helpful to the president in the sense that it does, that there's no endorsement of an obstruction of justice charge in here anywhere. That's the most helpful part for the president. The, the part that damages the president is that Comey clearly portrays himself as someone Trump was trying to manipulate and steer into making sort of compromising statements like, yes, sir, I will be loyal to you, sir. And of course, we have to all view this in the context of what happened later. Namely, Comey was fired. And he was fired in a situation where the administration offered uh, inconsistent or uh, differing accounts of the rationale for his firing. So I think if, if I were on the committee, what I would be asking or trying to get out of these hearings would be, gee, Mr. Comey, in light of everything you say in this, why was it in your view that you were fired? Because there's the appearance, at least, that because Trump didn't get this guarantee of loyalty, he felt he had but to he let go. But he did get the guarantee of loyalty. In fact, there were a lot of words in this statement uh, that Comey put out to actually say that he, he gives a lot of setup and he talks about later about how he had a different meaning. But in fact, he did pledge his loyalty. Not loyalty. No. He said no. honesty. And then the president said honest, honest loyalty. loyalty. That's what the president said. And then, and then, he then said Comey you have says it. he sat there with nothing on his no, face. No, he said you have my honest loyalty. I understand. Uh, but they, he, he writes he didn't give that Trump he didn't, the words that wasn't, Trump wanted. He like, pledging loyalty to the president. My point is, is that, is it appropriate? Jonathan Turley, who I respect a lot, said he does not see anything that rises to the level of obstruction of justice. Um, but, quote, the comments are grossly inappropriate, but we do not indict people for being boorish or clueless. That's Jonathan Turley commenting on what he reads Comey saying the president said. As usual, Jonathan Turley is right. Uh, what the president was doing was trying to sort of uh, seduce him, but seduction is not an impeachable offense. Well, 
perhaps in the 90s, but it's not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to check the record on that. Here's, here's the, the most important passage in the Comey testimony is this. The president went on to say that if there were some satellite associates of his who did something wrong, it would be good to find that out. But that he hadn't done anything wrong and hoped I would find a way to get it out that we weren't investigating him. Look at it from Trump's point of view. The guy, head of the FBI, has told him three times he's not subject of investigation. The press is in a frenzy over what did he do, when did he do it, what did he know. And Comey says we didn't tell the president why we were not going public. It's a plausible reason, he said, because if we did, then we'd have a duty to undo it to tell the world that he was under investigation if there were a change. Just like you did The with way Hillary. he did with Hillary. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's almost not, exactly the same. Right. It is, it is suggesting, it's not getting to, I'm not going to say whether there's a crime here or not. I'm going to tell, tell you this, and then you decide. But from Trump's point of view, I'm the one who's getting pilloried on this. The FBI director agrees with me, but they won't say it out loud. And I'm stuck. Now, and he also says, if there are people, satellites, associates, go get them. This is not obstruction. This is not shutting the investigation down. It could be throwing some of these people under the bus. But it is saying, on the big one, was I involved? You're telling me I wasn't. How about letting the world know? That, to me, is a totally plausible scenario. And it's the one that Comey is offering. He says, lift the cloud, is the president, right. according to Comey. And, and one more thing on Michael Flynn specifically is, if you look at the context of, of, of Trump's remarks, uh, there has been a report in the Washington Post a, a week or so earlier that the FBI found nothing illegal in Flynn's conversations with the Russians. Uh, Trump has fired Flynn. So he says to the FBI director, come on, you, you haven't found anything. I've fired the guy. Can you move Here's on? Here's what we don't now, know, Byron. We don't know what Flynn told the FBI. Exactly. And enough. if he told the FBI what he right. told my, Vice President Pence, then he's at risk of call lying me, to the FBI. Call me raise the issue in the testimony that, that, uh, that Trump may not have known about Flynn lying to the FBI if he did. Uh, but that is the context for Trump's actually making this statement. All right, I want to play one soundbite from a former director of national intelligence, Clapper and um, Norm Eisen from the Brookings Institution. I have to say, though, that I think uh, you know, compare the two that Watergate pales uh, really uh, in my view, uh, as, as compared to what we're, uh, we're confronting now. This moves us into the same realm uh, as Nixon's obstruction, maybe worse. This is the equivalent of the Nixon tapes. And uh, um, uh, we wow. are headed into very, very choppy waters. I mean, I spent, I don't know, two hours watching cable coverage. It was all over the board, and it was more towards that than it was anything else. Uh, the, it, whenever anyone makes a comparison to Watergate in this town, it's usually a desperate plea for attention. At this point, the only similarities you have are highly placed intelligence officials leaking to the press. But we don't even have anyone who's come forth with a crime yet. And we are still waiting to hear what this crime is in which Trump or people might be implicated. And it's far past time for these intelligence officials who have been playing this game and putting out innuendos about Watergate to actually give us some substance on which to hang it or they need to just you know put up or shut up at because this point. Chuck when you read this all the way through it's we don't get a sense of collusion we have not had any leaks of specific collusion as of yet but we are starting to get that the focus is on possible obstruction well I mean I don't know if Jim Clapper spoke before or after this Comey before thing came out whether his view would have been different if he'd read it but I do I do think he's just going off half cocked there it's way too early to draw that comparison and I find it very ironic actually considering that Jim Clapper was in the middle of the last big scandal that was supposed to be worse than Watergate the thing about the NSA where a lot of people think he wasn't very forthright with Congress so you know he's he's doing some stuff there but look what what it looks to me like we know so far is the president and my judgment had a conversation with Jim Comey he shouldn't have had. And whether, you know, trying to get him to relieve the pressure on Mike Flynn over his, Rus his, uh, his Russia ties, Flynn's own Russia ties, or whatever it was, 
that was an inappropriate conversation. I'm not willing to say yet that it rises the level of obstruction of justice, but to put that together with then later on firing him, it's just, you know, it's bad conduct. And, you know, you can call it whatever you want, but I think that that is definitely the stuff of a legitimate congressional investigation. Whether you want to call it Watergate or not, you know, is another story. All right, I want to just play this uh, one long soundbite from the hearing today uh, and get you to comment, and then I've got some breaking news to talk about in just a minute. Um, we don't have that one because it's on the next panel. Let's talk about this briefly. Um, this is the back and forth today with the intelligence officials who say, I've never felt pressured, I never felt uh, directed to, to squelch or silence an investigation, but the committee was not having it, or at least Democrats on the committee. Uh, you do have it? Let's go. I have never been directed to do anything I believe to be illegal, immoral, unethical, or inappropriate. I do not recall ever feeling pressured to do so. I have never felt pressure uh, to uh, intervene or interfere in any way and shape with shaping intelligence in a political way uh, or um, in, in relationship all to I'd, an ongoing all I'd, investigation. All I'd say, can you set the record straight about what happened or didn't happen? I do not feel it's appropriate for me to, in a public session, um, in which uh, confidential uh, conversations between the president and myself. What's the basis for your refusal to answer these questions today? I do not believe it is appropriate for me to. What's the get basis? Into it. I'm not satisfied with. I do not believe it is appropriate, or I do not feel I should answer. I want to. Uh, I want to understand a legal basis. You swore that oath to tell us the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and today you are refusing to do so. What is the legal basis for your refusal to testify to this committee? I'm not sure I have a legal basis. All right, so they pressed and pressed and pressed. They wanted to find out about the specific conversations. On the one hand, Charles, they have a point. They didn't exert executive privilege. They went to testify under oath, and they wouldn't answer yes or no, did the president say this or not. But they also answered broadly on the overall question that they're asking or getting at. I think the uh, advantage here is to the senators. If you're going to go up there and you say, I refuse to talk about what was said, well, then invoke executive privilege. That's a legal basis. Fight it out on that. that. But to say, I don't think it's appropriate, I think the senators are right. On the basis of what? And if you listen to what the intelligence chiefs were saying, they were saying we were not directed. They were asked, were you asked? And they returned to the language directed. This is lawyerly stuff. I hate to say it, but it's rather Clintonian. It depends what directed means. And it sounds as if it's very carefully crafted. The senators have a right to know. I'm not sure that the public has to, but fight it out on executive privilege and what you can tell us, let us know. Otherwise, you know, if you're going to testify, speak. Quickly. I have to agree with that. Now, Dan Coates was in effect saying, I'll tell you in private session. Can we just go into a private session and I'll tell you? So we don't know what he said, whether he satisfied them at all, but it seems odd that in a conversation that they're not claiming privilege for, that they won't talk about it. We'll have much more on this on the online show right after this show, but some breaking news out of North Korea after this break. This is a Fox News alert. Uh, you're looking at some file video there, but within the past few hours, we're getting news from South Korea that North Korea launched a salvo of ballistic missiles from the East Coast uh, Thursday. Um, the South Korean military is saying they are surface-to-ship missiles, and they're investigating the U.S. military, uh, looking at all that this possibly means, especially with news out of South Korea today, that we broke here on this show, that they were suspending the THAAD missile batteries that we were sending uh, to South Korea, which was seen as a big victory for China, which was concerned about them, and possibly a big loss for the Trump administration. But now North Korea fires some missiles. Uh, Byron. 
I guess the response of the Trump administration is going to be, okay, what, what, what were we saying? What are you going to do now? Uh, it does seem that the two are linked, and uh, it, it does seem that what, what the United States was saying was so entirely reasonable. Don't know why they rejected it, but maybe they'll change their mind now. It is new South Korean leadership here that was tied more to China, it seemed, and a little bit skittish about the THAAD system. And extremely interested in a kind of reconciliation with the North, not at all a strong anti-North ally, the way the previous government was. You notice this is a shorter ship missile. We now are putting three carrier groups in the region. It's a way to say to us that we can threaten your naval dominance. I think this is just the new South Korean regime caving in to Chinese hegemony in the region and realizing that America is no longer the protector it was. This is a big shift. For all of our focus here in Washington about this testimony tomorrow or about this whole investigation, uh, it's hard to overstate the importance of this issue North Korea and the threat it poses. Well, a couple of points adding on to what Charles said. There was a huge uh, political conflict in South Korea about the way in which the STAD, the STAD system was deployed. It was thought to be sort of um, inappropri inappropriately non-transparent with respect to South's own government. This president came in sort of promising to correct all that. We thought this had gotten back on track, so it's a little bit of a mystery as to why they were suddenly withdrawn. And I would say it looks like what the North Korea Koreans are trying to do is something they always try to do, which is when they see internal conflict within the South Korean camp, they try to exacerbate that by doing something provocative on their side. And finally, this is all a reminder of how everything we're obsessed with in Washington, however validly, could all seem totally irrelevant tomorrow if some international crisis explodes. My, you know, We have this very volatile thing going on in Qatar right now as between them and the other Arab states. That too could turn into war uh, if things aren't well managed. And it would be nice if they were well managed. Molly. In his speech in Riyadh, Donald Trump talked to Muslim allies about the need to take care of their own problems saying the U.S. would be there to support, but regional solutions need to be preeminent. Same is true for this uh, North Korea situation. We have been turning our attention there after years of not doing so, but there's a lot of room for regional allies to play a role here. I think there are some who say, okay, South Korea, we can pull our troops home and see how everything goes. Well, I mean, this is a, a pr really provocative anti-American step. We already have the four Thaga batteries in place, and they're essentially saying we're not going to use them. Perhaps you have to dismantle them. We've been out there on the front lines on the DMC with thousands of American troops who are there to die if there's a North Korean invasion. We might say, well, you know, we might want to reconsider that. Breaking news all day today. When we come back, how you can keep watching the All-Star panel tonight after the show.